In this video, I'm going to focus on the spectro attack and I'm going to walk through two different examples of this attack. In the previous video, we've already seen an example of the meltdown attack and how programs leave footprints behind and how I can use side channels to examine these footprints. And I'm going to use a similar concept over here as well. There are a few differences though. So in this case, I'm assuming that I have an attacker program and I have a victim program. And both of these programs are running on the same server. And this attacker is trying to steal the secrets that belong to this victim program. So this attacker is actually sending queries to this victim. And so this victim is you know, accepting these queries and then performing certain operations. And so the attacker is actually able to control some of the variables inside the victim based on the queries that it is providing. So in this particular piece of code over here, there is a variable x that's actually being controlled by the attacker. And then further, the victim has two primary data structures. So there's a data structure array one, and then there's a second data structure array two. And if you look at the victim code, it's actually pretty well designed and it looks fairly innocuous, right? So when it receives an input from the attacker, it confirms that this input X is within the bounds of array one. And once it does that check, it's going to go ahead and access array one. And once it gets that value, it's going to use that as an index into array two. Okay, so as an example, let's say that array one has the numbers five, 10, and 20 as its first three entries. And let's say that the attacker is providing back-to-back -back inputs, and so it's able to control the values of x, and it provides input values of you know x being 0, 1, and 2. And so when it provides an input of 0, you end up accessing array 1, 0, which equals the number 5. And once you've done that, you're going to then perform an access to array 2, and you're going to use 5 as the index. Right, and the next time you send an input of x equals 1, you end up fetching the value 10, and then you look up index 10 over here. When you provide x equals 2, you get a value of 20 from array 1, and then you look up index number 20. Right, so what's happening over here is that the internal secrets of this victim program, which might be in array 1, are now being betrayed by the access pattern to array 2. Right, so based on the value 5, I look up index 5. Based on the value 10, I look up index 10. Based on the value 20, I look up index number 20. Okay, and so even though I'm never exposing the contents of array one, I am exhibiting an access pattern which may reveal my secrets. So what the attacker does is it first warms up the cache with, with its own data. This is exactly like I showed you for the meltdown attack. And then it provides a query where it sets the value of x equal to 0, right? So we have a cache over here which has data that belongs to the attacker. And now when the victim runs, there is this block that is brought into the cache, and then there is this block that is brought into the cache. Since this block up over here is at index 0, let's assume that it somehow gets placed into index 0 of the cache. And this block, since it's at index 5, it ends up getting placed at index 5 in the cache. And now that the query has been serviced, the control returns back to the attacker. And the attacker now is going to walk through its cache. And it's going to take timing measurements of exactly how long it takes to access each of its elements. So all the elements of the attacker that sit in these locations over here are going to be cache hits. But the attacker sees a cache miss over here at index 0, and it sees a cache miss over here at index 5. The cache miss at index 0 was expected because the attacker provided an input of x equal to 0. But this miss over here reveals that the contents of array 1 over here was the number 5. Right? So even though the number 5 was never directly handed over to the attacker, the contents of array 1 are determining the footprints in array 2 and hence determining the footprints being left behind in the cache. And then the attacker uses a side channel to figure out exactly what that footprint is. And what makes this problem even worse is that because processors do out-of-order execution, because they do speculation and branch prediction, I can give a really high value of x over here 
and those instructions will eventually be squashed, right? But in the meantime, the processor dives into this piece of code over here because X is usually less than array one size and it can start fetching any location in memory. And so by giving a really large value of X, I can go well past the bounds of array one and I can access any portion of memory that belongs to the victim. And so branch prediction makes this problem much worse and it exposes the entire contents of the victim's memory to the attacker. And you'll see over here that there's really no hardware bug, right? This is happening because the program itself has this nature where internal secrets are betrayed through the access pattern. And then I'm using speculation to just amplify this problem. So this is a problem that's not easy to fix. There might be some hardware techniques that can help defend against such an attack. So for example, if I partition my cache and make sure that the victim gets half the cache and the attacker gets half the cache, there's no way for the attacker to examine the footprints being left behind by the victim in its portion of the cache. Now let's look at a second example that's equally diabolical. So here's the victim's code and let's say that register R1 is a value that the attacker can control and let's say that register R2 contains some secret that is internal to the victim, right? Let's say some secret key. And the victim then arrives at this branch statement, which is at label zero, and it chooses to either go left or right. Now within the victim code, there is some other remote location in the code at let's say label one, where there's a load to an address that's situated in register R2, right? And you know, there may be some code over here that sets the value of R2. But what the attacker is going to do is it's going to get to this part of the code and then somehow it's magically going to jump to this instruction over here, right? So the attacker is forcing a certain value to be placed in this case in R2, right? Some internal secret key has been placed in R2 and then I'm forcing the program to jump to an instruction that loads from an address that's located in R2. Right? And so this is where I'm going to be leaving behind a footprint in the cache where the footprint is a function of the secret key. So how exactly does the attacker force the victim to get to this point in the code and then jump to this location over here? It does it by first running the attacker and running this code in the attacker where there's an if statement at label zero and this branch is always taken and it jumps to label one. And so if you keep running this code in the attacker, the branch predictor gets warmed up. And so there's an entry over here which says that when you encounter label zero, the branch should be taken and it should jump to label one. And so when you context switch from the attacker's code to the victim code, it turns out that branch predictors are not flushed on every single context switch. So when the victim runs, when it gets to label zero, it looks up the branch predictor and it says, oh, looks like I should be jumping to label one. And so it jumps over here and starts executing this instruction. And so it's now leaving footprints, which are a function of the secret key in R2. Obviously the processor after a while realizes that the branch was mispredicted and instead you should be going either, you know, left or right. And so the course is corrected. But in the meantime, the damage has been done, right? You've already brought things into the cache and the attacker can again resume execution. It can walk through the cache. And just as we showed you before, it can use the cache side channel to extract information from the victim. So both of these are, are pretty scary attacks and they're not based on any bug in the hardware design. So they're not easy to fix. These are possible because the hardware does aggressive things. It does aggressive speculation. And unfortunately, sometimes the victim has code which leaves footprints behind. Or even worse, in this case, the code does not even appear vulnerable, right? So what, what the attacker over here has done is the attacker has taken, you know, two different pieces of code that are unrelated, has stitched them together, you know, thanks to the branch predictor, and has created a vulnerability that did not exist in the original program. So these are scary problems, and we've not quite figured out an efficient fix to address these concerns, right? So like I said earlier, if, if you are able to partition the cache, it's possible for the attacker to not examine the footprints being left behind by the victim. And so you may see solutions like this showing up in future processes. So this concludes my discussion of the meltdown and spectro attacks. And you'll see over here that 
these speculation techniques that were so great for performance have these very evil side effects. And so moving forward, we might see a shift in how processors are designed. And you might see more of a focus on information leakage and trying to extract performance in a manner that does not betray secrets to malicious agents.